All right. I think we should probably uh, get started, although I see people are still uh, joining us. Um, let me welcome you back to the final session of the virtual um, segment of uh, CNI's um, December 2021 uh, member meeting. Uh, I'm Cliff Lynch, uh, the director of CNI, and um, I'm very pleased that you joined us for this session today. I think you will find this very interesting, and um, I hope that we will be able to um, have some conversation with our presenters um, after they've uh, taken us through this, because I think there's a lot of uncertainty. There are a lot of different points of view around this, and yet it's a, it's really quite a um, quite a critical issue for the way knowledge is going to be disseminated and how the culture of scholarship is going to operate in different fields going forward. Um, it's easy to kind of um, uh, you know, minimize this issue, um, but it, it it actually is quite a quite a seriously significant one. Um, it also has implications for things like the health of some of our scholarly societies, um, particularly financially. So, um, just a couple of quick notes uh, before I turn it over to our presenters. Um, Danielle Cooper um, will not be joining us today, but um, uh, Laura Brown and Dylan Rudiger will um, uh, authoritatively cover the uh, issues at hand. Um, uh, Danielle sends her regrets. Um, we've got the, this session, <coughs> as we have all the sessions for this virtual meeting, in um, web meeting rather than webinar mode. So you can in fact see who's uh, with us uh, by looking at the participants and you should feel free to drop messages to your colleagues and things like that. Uh, if you like also, please feel free to use the chat for comments or questions as the, um, as the presentation unfolds. Uh, when we finish up with the discussion at the end of this invited um, presentation, um, I'll say just a few brief words to uh, close our virtual event for 2021. Um, so I will um, see you on the other side of this. And um, with that, let me welcome uh, Dylan and Laura. Uh, thank you so much for coming to talk about this. and. Thank you also for the um, excellent uh, report that you've put out, uh, which I'm sure you will have a link to somewhere in your presentation. And I have also shared with the CNI announcements list prior. Um, so welcome and over to you. Thanks a lot, Cliff, and, and greetings, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this session on COVID and the future of scholarly meetings. So let me start out by just introducing us. Uh, I'm Laura Brown. Until recently, I was the managing director of JSTOR, and now I'm a senior advisor at Ithaca, where I work all across all our services and uh, on research and, and special projects. And my colleague, uh, Dylan Riediger, is a qualitative analyst at Ithaca SNR and a former staff member of the American Historical Association. So he's had some um, firsthand experience of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, so Dylan and I will be talking today about a new uh, combined Ithaca SNR and JSTOR Labs project. This is the first time that this kind of uh, collaboration has happened within our organization to help scholarly societies imagine the future of their academic conferences. Um, this initiative actually grew out of a series of interviews that Roger Schoenfeld and I conducted with societies um, right in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, the, the biggest concern we heard during uh, many, many concerns was a, about the effect of the pandemic on their meeting plans. 
This was the most worrisome issue. And, and several of the societies asked us if we had useful advice or research we could share with them about this. So this project is the result of that question. And, and thanks to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, we have funding to support the inquiry. Uh, we wanna be as interactive as possible today. So we plan to make just a short presentation um, outlining questions and issues and giving you a little sense of what the scope of the project is. Um, and then we wanna leave plenty of time for a substantial uh, open discussion, um, questions, uh, any kind of feedback that you can give us, it would be helpful in shaping this too. So uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Dylan now to do our short presentation and then we'll invite questions and discussion at the end. So over to you, Dylan. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for the, the introduction and the framing remarks. Um, as, as Laura mentioned, we're going to try to kind of get in and out quickly today to maximize the opportunities for interaction here. We really are in a learning mode um, and phase of this project. And so we're really excited for the opportunity to talk with people who attend and organize conferences and have staff that, that go to conferences and who are immersed in the issues who can help us as we um, think through what this project is going to ultimately end up looking like. Um, but in, in terms of some some initial kind of framing remarks, um, I think I would start by saying that, um, you know, as of early 2020, the basic model for scholarly conferences um, reflected what I, I think it's fair to characterize uh, as kind of aging ideas about what scholarly communication looked like. Um, as well as ideas about the composition of scholarly communities that were increasingly at odds with what the actual composition of those communities looked like. And so you had kind of conference models that um, really were a, a little bit long in the tooth and had been around for quite some time without um, a whole lot of change in many fields. Um, and part of the reason for this is that steering a new course for scholarly conferences, especially the kind of big flagship conferences um, that many scholarly societies hosts, um, is quite a difficult undertaking. It involves a lot of complicated financial, legal, technical issues, um, staffing issues, and um, efforts to balance the competing interests of members of scholarly communities that all kind of collectively make it very difficult to uh, radically steer new courses um, for meetings. They have a lot of legacy policies and um, forms that once kind of they become entrenched are very difficult to disentangle. Um, however, when the, when the pandemic broke out, um, it, as Laura has already alluded to, it was obviously a pretty substantial challenge for many scholarly societies, but it also provided a rather unexpected opportunity to shake up a genre that was beset by a number of challenges and kind of growing tensions um, that we see across a number of different scholarly communities. Um, before the pandemic started, uh, scholar societies were already facing calls from their members to rethink their reliance on in-person meetings. Uh, and the criticisms of these conferences were coming from a number of different directions. There were environmental concerns about the carbon cost of travel, which was probably the most significant um, voiced, significant and most often voiced concern among constituencies, particularly in fields in the environmental sciences, but also in other fields as well, um, where members were really calling upon societies to justify the amount of air travel involved in in-person meetings and pointing towards virtual and hybrid models as a potential way to limit the carbon costs of, of academic gatherings. Um, there were also pretty substantial and growing um, concerns about accessibility and equity issues um, related to in-person gatherings. Some of these were related to uh, issues of disability and ability of, of members of the community, but also a, a lot of issues related to economic inequalities um, that were making the meeting increasingly inaccessible or a substantial burden for different kinds of constituencies who met at the, at the annual meeting, um, in particular, perhaps early career and graduate students who were, who were attending. Um, there were also, um, and have been, and I think this trend, it's safe to say, will, will likely continue, um, 
fewer and fewer places where it felt safe to meet. Um, to cite just one example, uh, the state of California has laws prohibiting the use of state funds for travel to a number of states, um, including places like Florida and Texas that might otherwise be prime meeting locations, but which become really untenable if California employees are unable to spend funds to attend meetings in those locations. And so when you think about the kind of moral um, and financial considerations that are involved in figuring out where to have an in-person meeting, the kind of politicization of um, most aspects of American life were making it increasingly difficult to find places to meet. Um, and, and finally, I would say that in, in some fields, um, there's been trends over the last decade or two towards reduced attendance at annual meetings, especially the big national conferences that scholarly societies are often involved in organizing. And so the, the, net, the, the revenue and the attendance associated with these meetings has been under pressure as well as people were kind of voting with their feet for various reasons about where they were gonna spend uh, their conference time and money. So even before COVID came out, there were already a lot of, um, kind of concerns percolating and bubbling up to the surface about the, the viability over the longer term of in-person meetings. Um, but despite those tensions, prior to COVID, relatively few associations had made meaningful moves towards virtual or hybrid meetings. Most of them were still holding most of their gatherings as in-person affairs. There had been experimentation with new forms of meetings, of course, um, but much of that was kind of tentative and on the margins and not very common in a, in a genre that was still very much focused on in-person uh, uh, meetings in most fields. Um, I would point to maybe one possible exception that I think is relatively important in this, which uh, perhaps especially applies to humanities and social sciences field, and that is the decreased commitment that societies had made to the idea that job interviews would be a central activity that took place at their meetings. Um, this was something that was largely forced on societies, either because hiring was declining or because Zoom and other video formats were increasingly becoming the kind of normal way to conduct first round interviews. But I think if you start to think about places where virtual formats were starting to um, creep into the activities that we often associate with annual meetings in particular, it's those job interviews where you started to see some of these trends um, emerging first, and also that has implications for why attendance, for instance, um, was under pressure in, in those fields as well. Um, but either way, COVID created a kind of unexpected opportunity, um, an unwelcome one for many societies, to all experiment simultaneously with new possibilities for what an annual meeting or a scholarly conference could look like. And in the now, you know, 20 months or so since COVID has broken out, we've seen uh, collectively a very rich um, body of experiments being conducted by societies really all over the planet about how to rethink what their conferences should look like going forward. Previous research uh, that Cliff alluded to that, that Ithaca SNR has conducted earlier this year has suggested that in many respects, the, the virtual conferences of the past couple of years have worked better than many people might have thought they would have. Um, the technological formats have proven viable to have meetings like the kind that we're having today. Um, and there's some emerging evidence that at least in some fields, the attendance for virtual conferences has been broader and more diverse um, than has sometimes been the case for in-person meetings. Um, it's also, I think, been shown that in, in that in some instances, certain kinds of presentation genres, and I would point perhaps to the poster as a really good example of this, have kind of been um, sites of particular experimentation and perhaps invigoration as the kind of recorded format for posters um, has given people an opportunity to talk about their work, not just show it um, and perhaps to have it seen by more people. But even though there's been a lot of successes and, and perhaps some surprising ones, um, I think it's also fair to say that the challenges remain fairly daunting. Um, Long-term financial models for funding virtual and in particular hybrid events um, are not clear at this moment. Uh, the staffing models, um, that would support them 
uh, don't necessarily align very well with the current staff that um, scholarly societies have. Um, the quality of engagement has been, I think it's safe to say, uneven at best. Um, this is particularly true of networking activities and the social aspects of conferences, the kind of things that go on between panels and at receptions have proven pretty difficult to replicate in online environments. And that means that the kind of, not only the networking functions, but the community functions of meetings, which is a really important part of what they do, have, um, haven't fared as well as perhaps the like scholarly communicative aspects of meetings. And finally, there's emerging questions about how and if it's appropriate to kind of monetize the increasingly large body of recorded content that's available as more and more conferences have uh, recorded and archived sessions, there's questions that are emerging about who owns the intellectual property right to those presentations, um, how it might be used as a, a benefit to members, how it might be perhaps sold um, and turned into content, and what the implication of thinking about um, scholarly presentations that were once um, mostly kind of ephemeral, what happens when you think about them as a kind of permanent archival stream of content that's available for, for later use. So there are a lot of questions that are still um, up in the air and remain to be answered satisfactorily. And these are the kind of things that the Future of Scholarly Meetings Project is really designed to address. Um, as Laura mentioned in her introduction, um, this is a, a project that the Sloan Foundation has funded and that Ithaca SNR and JSTOR Labs will be running together. Um, and it's a new kind of experiment for our two um, units of, of Ithaca to collaborate in this way. And we're going to be convening a cohort of scholarly societies beginning in January of 2022 for a year long project combining research, design thinking, and opportunities to share knowledge and explore together within a cohort environment to try to uh, chart a collective future towards scholarly meetings. And throughout the project, we're going to be looking for actionable, kind of feasible, immediate interventions into the conference space, but we'll also be keeping a very close eye on the bigger picture kind of conceptual issues that are in play here. Um, what is the purpose of meeting in the first place? Um, what are we trying to accomplish when we bring scholarly communities together? What kinds of communicative formats are we trying to foster and encourage? And how do shifts in the modality of the way that we meet create new opportunities to align purpose and format or to use novel formats to create new kinds of purposes for what scholarship can be and what scholarly communities can look like. The, the key features of this project will be a series of workshops and meetings um, that will convene representatives from 17 scholarly societies together for sustained um, exploration and conversation uh, about topics of immediate strategic importance for annual meetings in particular, but scholarly gatherings in general. Um, uh, combined with a series of research projects that Ithaca SNR will undertake that are designed to provide data to support uh, data-driven decision-making about technological um, options, about models that are emerging from either other scholarly associations or meetings that are taking place in kind of academic, academic adjacent spaces or even beyond academia entirely. Um, and so to bring models that can, that can um, make the thinking inside those conversations informed by data. And then finally, um, JSTOR Labs will be bringing to the table their expertise in design thinking and in design informed experimentation so that the product of that research and those conversations can then be put through kind of iterative um, design work that's designed to result in the creation of several prototypes of new innovations in the conference space um, that grow out of specific concerns that emerge from the cohort. And I think it's this kind of combination of conversation and uh, a community of learners, research, and iterative design thinking that make this pro project so interesting and, and, and promising. 
we're excited to announce that just this morning, actually, um, we have publicly announced the list of societies who will be collaborating with us on this work. Um, this is a, you can see some of the logos for the organizations here. They're probably kind of small on Zoom. Um, I won't read them all, but I will say that they range widely, both in terms of disciplines that are affiliated with the project. We have a large number of STEM fields, but also social science and humanities fields and interdisciplinary fields um, represented in the cohort. We also have, and I, I think this is quite important and will be really interesting to see how this plays out, uh, societies of widely different sizes. Um, some of these organizations, the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, for instance, are quite large. Others of them, the Bibliographical Society of America, for instance, or the Oceanography Society are quite small. And this makes, um, this has important implications for how they think about the future of the meetings. Um, if you have a, a staff of around 20, like the American Historical Association does, you have many different options that are on the table uh, than if you're the American Arachnological Society and you have zero full-time equivalent staff and are in fact your conference is organized by volunteers. And so by bringing all these groups together, we'll have both kind of two cohorts of, of smaller and larger societies that can work with each other, but also we'll have opportunities for thinking across um, organizational structures and sizes that should produce um, really interesting ideas. The, the project's going to launch in January with an initial series of fact-finding activities to gather some initial information about the experiences that the societies have had over the past couple of years. Um, and then we'll convene a series of meetings over the course of 2022. These will all be kind of working workshops. Um, and at the centerpiece of these will be the design lab that JSTOR Labs will be running in the summer, which will produce some kind of iterative design work. And a final public report will be published at the end of 2022. Um, and we anticipate that the innovations that the cohort will begin to um, collectively come up with will start showing up in scholarly conferences and annual meetings um, as early as 2023. So as, I'm, as both Laura and I have mentioned, um, we're really at the initial phase of this project. Um, we're, we're officially launching it next month. Um, and we're currently in a learning mode. And we, we took this opportunity and this gracious invitation from Cliff as a chance to uh, really have a conversation with the people who are here today um, and to, to gather more information as we approach uh, the beginning of this project. And we knew that we would have here um, today people who attend conferences, who organize them, um, who have staff that they have to think about how to use conferences for professional development purposes. Um, and we really wanted to uh, leave as much time as possible for open conversation. So we're going to open things up for the remainder of the session um, to a conversation with everyone who's here. Um, we have a couple of initial ideas that we wanted to put on the table as possible topics for conversation. Um, but these are really just meant to be conversation starters more than um, to dictate what we need to talk about. Some of the things that we though would be interested to hear is generally about your experience at COVID era conferences and what you think has been successful or less successful. Um, whether or not and to what extent and how your thinking has changed around when it's necessary for you or your staff to attend conferences in person and when it's more appropriate to um, meet in virtual or hybrid formats. And also what kind of agenda items you'd like to see on the table as we start um, planning the workshops that will constitute much of this um, much of this project. So with that, um, I'll close my remarks and we'll open up the floor to people um, who'd like to talk. And I'm going to shut the slides down. If I can figure out how to do it. So do we have any questions, Laura? I don't think so. I think we're just very eager to hear uh, some of the experiences people have had and, um, and especially like where where you all see there's opportunity um, that uh, we, you know, you you think we should be focusing on. I know one thing that came out very strongly in the interview process 
uh, was the question of uh, vendor exhibits and how they had they had basically been done the same way for decades and um, not too much taken advantage of in terms of uh, you know what's possible with digital or some kind of a hybrid thing. Um, if you look at uh, the exhibit, uh, the the raison d'etre, it's it's bringing together what what the society brings is the community, the the organized community of learners and and experts into that space, and then the vendors want to reach that community with their services. And you know what happens lots of times is people are sitting in a hall for a long time just you know talking uh, vendors talking to each other and the opportunity to really interact is is limited um and you know what kind of reimagination could we do there that would be powerful for all those st different stakeholders so those are the kinds of questions we have uh that i think people are starting to to wonder about given what they've just been through in the last year and a half but what we're interested in all those kinds of questions, um, where there are opportunities. So I see we have a couple of questions and comments coming in on the chat. Um, and um, uh, I think I, I think um, I, I think one question is about um, about the necessity for specialized conference platforms as opposed to a general purpose tool like Zoom. Um, uh, I think it would be interesting to hear um, uh, what you're thinking about that. And uh, one of our colleagues had a comment on that, um, Scout. Uh, um, another question that um that that's kind of implicit in some of the things that michael seidel um mentioned in his comment um is the is in, is international scope um and um uh there's a particular sub piece of that i'd really love to hear you um uh reflect on a little bit and that's time zones um when you've when you're dealing with something that's mostly in in a couple of adjacent time zones, like CNI, um, yes, there are a few there are a few individual outliers, but <clears throat> mostly it coheres into a, a fairly compact set of time zones. On the other hand, when you get these really international meetings, where you know in the in the in person times everybody sort of made a pact to go away someplace, get on the local time zone for a few days and uh, have the meeting. Um, that seems to really not work um, in, in the digital environment. And I'm wondering if you're hearing people think that one through at all. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting and important question, Cliff. And it's something that I've been trying to think through. I mean, one of the traditional features of in-person conferences for better or worse and it cuts both ways is that they've been physical gatherings of communities in often kind of liminal spaces people get on a plane and they leave their house and they go somewhere else and they're together for a concentrated period of time and it creates a physical kind of manifestation of a community it also creates a kind of temporal bubble for people to inhabit a conference um, in a in a very kind of totalizing way, um, and the virtual conferences often end up being integrated into life rather than kind of uh, set aside from the rest of life. Um, and so, I think that as one of the one of the questions that I think is on the table is like, what's the value of the conference as a liminal and physical space that's kind of separate from a lot of the rest of life. And, and, and then what are the disadvantages of that? And also in relation to things like time zones, we're also seeing in a lot of instances, uh, a, a trend towards lengthening the time of conferences. Some of this is about optimizing time zones that are um, convenient for as many people as possible. Some of this is about um, 
you know, realizing that if you're not bound by hotel contracts and airplane flights that you can meet for two weeks or three weeks instead of over a long weekend. But as you stretch the kind of, as you, as you play with time and stretch it out, you lose that sense of a conference as a, a kind of singular event that's happening. And it becomes closer to um, almost like at extremes, potentially some kind of like Netflix out there where you can just kind of turn it on anytime and see a conference happening somewhere or another. Um, and so I think, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answers to these things are, but I think as you play around with the temporality of conferences, you gain advantages like not having to have 8 a.m. sessions or being able to think across time zones in new ways, but you also have to reckon with what's lost when you're not meeting in a kind of liminal physical space, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that I, just extracting yourself from your regular life to be 100% at a conference uh, makes a huge difference to the success of the conference. Um, on the other hand, uh, the participation that can happen from so many different uh, parts of the organization in a virtual meeting, uh, people were really excited about that, and you know, getting students involved and uh, you know, lowering the cost and all of that. Um, I I do think that um, one of the things we heard was that uh, there was more interest in doing regional meetings, um, and that that uh, I don't know if you all are finding that, but the idea that uh, they could be less um, heavy to stage and more uh, focused on the concerns of, uh, you know, that particular region, or even that, uh, you know, sort of topically uh, focused, but that a more intimate meeting in, a, um, in an online space can sometimes be more successful than a giant uh, presentation mode, um, especially, especially when the presentation mode is like the old fashioned, let me get up there and talk as an academic for an, you know, 45 minutes about my paper. And that on Zoom or whatever the medium is can just, you know, be deadly in a way that um, the, you up the ante on, well, if you're going to try and entertain people for that period of time, you know, in a, in a, in a medium that people are usually they are entertained by that the whole idea of a presentation may need to be different. Um, they need to be more highly staged and more thoughtful about audience and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I do think that the, the idea of smaller, I think somebody said here that the, they, they, they thought that more, the smaller meetings were much more effective because they could be more informal and actually more interactive. Um, uh, that, that that may be an opportunity that would be interesting. And when the big conferences happen, that there may be like a whole new level that we have to get to, to present something that's worth people sitting there. Laura, uh, uh, there's a question that's come in that, that has to do with vendors that I, I'll, I'll just ask you if you wanna take a crack at. Um, and it, it, it's, from, it's from Lisa Hinchcliffe. Um, who says that you know one question is about which subpopulations of people are no longer attending virtual meetings. Um, she says that she's heard from vendors that there are more attendees, but they're not the decision makers on purchasing who are coming. And so the uh, overall effect is um, that you know the vendors aren't selling as much because the right people aren't there. Mm -hmm. Has that was that something that come, came up in the interviews that you and Roger did? Uh no, not so much. I think that um, what came up more from that was just that, uh, you know, that a lot of vendors, I think, would love the opportunity to rethink how to have the right kinds of conversations, what the conversation should look like, how to, uh, you know, how to present things in some way that, that, enticed people. So I do think that's a question of if there are, if people aren't attend, you know, quote unquote attending, time is very fluid in this environment um, that you can schedule all kinds of different um, ways to have the conference. And so uh, 
it might be that that's one of the things that has to be rethought is how do you get the decision makers to attend some of the virtual mm -hmm. um, exhibit stuff that doesn't look like walking around virtually into people's booths and seeing what they're doing, but something much more dynamic that way. Um, I, I, I think that's right for um, conversation. Uh, but we didn't hear, we didn't hear that, uh, we heard that more people who hadn't been able to go before were able to go, mm -hmm. but we hadn't heard that the, um, you know, sort of the leadership had decided not to go or. Yeah, I, I, I've talked um, over the past couple of months with uh, several different vendors. And the issue that I've heard mostly is more about just getting people to come to the virtual exhibit halls is very challenging. And that the offerings that people are, are presenting are not getting a lot of views um, and are not the traffic is just down considerably. Um, I also, I did some exploratory research earlier this year to try to figure out um, what I could find out about uh, demographics of who was attending um, annual meetings in 10 or 11 fields. Um, and it was pretty difficult to find out much specific information. Um, this is one of the things that I think we're going to be in a position when we have the cohort together to learn more about because societies do have a pretty good idea who's attending their meetings. Um, they often either don't publish that information or it, or it gets published, you know, on a delayed schedule. Um, but by bringing together a, a group of societies from a bunch of different fields, one of the things we'll be trying to, to find out together is who's attending the meeting, um, and you know what their profile looked like. There's been, for instance, some evidence to suggest that graduate students and early career people are more likely to attend virtual meetings, but there isn't a whole lot of hard data to back that up um, that I'm aware of. And this will be something that we'll be in a position to, to understand it with much greater specificity. And I would think that um, Lisa's question about like who's coming is the kind of thing that societies probably know and are not for one reason or another sharing in a public setting. Um, we have a number of comments coming in the chat. It's actually so many of them that it's hard to keep track of. I would encourage people if they have something they wanna say to just say it. Um, there's no reason that this needs to be the Laura and Dylan show. So if you've got a comment that you wanna to chime in on, please, please feel free um, to turn this into a real discussion. And in the, that'll also allow us a little time to scroll through the chat. <laughs> Yeah, if oh. if somebody wants to actually talk, um, uh, just go go for it. Turn your mic on, and uh, or um, it, I can do flow con floor control if necessary. If there are too many people who want to talk at once, well, I'm happy to say a few words because this is an issue which uh, the I schools deal with quite actively. We are planning right now for our third virtual conference. And one of the real challenges is something you said, the social aspects of it. Um, Dale was talking about that too. That's one of the things that we don't always do well in physical conferences. We cover the planet. So we have time zones from uh, New Zealand to Pacific uh, in the US and Canada. And um, this is all challenging, but it is learnable. We are happy to share our experiences with anyone who is interested we also use a vendor that allows people to create their own breakout sessions, which I think is a big plus because it allows for conversations. I could go on for much longer, but I will stop. Unless, of course, there's a gap. Well, S Scout has a quest, uh, a comment, which I think is just really important. Um, and. Uh, perhaps um, uh, she, she suggests you might speak to this, Michael, but I think others, others will want to wade in as well. And that's about mentorship for early career people, graduate students. Um, and that's, that's as much a social process as anything else. Um, and uh, you know, re really seems to be at p in peril in the virtual environment. Um, uh, but it's so important. 
I, I will just say a word about this because this is something that has come to our attention too. We have early career and graduate student sessions. One of the things that we're really trying to do is to mix it so that the people in those also get to engage not just at a particular time and with a particular set of people, but with more people. Uh, in theory, this is possible. The, our J Japanese members especially would like not just to talk to other Japanese, but would like to talk um, to Chinese, to people in Europe, to people elsewhere in the world. Um, enabling that all is a technical challenge, but we're working on it. We were learning many things and we need to learn more. Yeah, I, think, I think the issue of early career mentorship is really a, a subsection of the general question of whether what the quality of engagement is like um, and how much of the value of conferences happens outside of the panels. Um, and certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll say for myself that I have not yet seen a platform um, that has really inspired me to feel uh, particularly engaged in the networks or receptions that I've attended. Um, in fact, I've found that those used to be my favorite part of academic conferences. And nowadays, when I see them on a conference schedule, I usually avoid them at all costs. Um, and I, I think that's a really tricky thing. And I, I, I don't, you know, I, I suspect this is something that our cohort is going to be very preoccupied with, not only because one of the functions of meetings is to kind of replicate scholarly communities to reproduce them over time and to provide by providing mentorship, but also because so much of the value that maybe particular the decision makers that Lisa was talking about earlier get from coming to these conferences is who they can see. Um, and the chats are a decent, you know, sometimes at, at getting people talking, but they're not the same thing as having a cup of coffee around a table, um, which I think Laura had mentioned this kind of um, interest in more regional gatherings. I think that's one thing that some societies are starting to think about is kind of what I'm seeing, what I've kind of calling like hub and spoke model conferences, um, where you might have a, a, a um, an annual meeting being organized in conjunction with a series of regional meetings. You might have a, a virtual virtual meeting that's actually happening live at different cities around a country or around the world. Um, there are all kinds of questions about how to do this effectively. The, the, many of them seem to, many of those models are built around the idea of hybrid meetings um, and hybrid meetings are very tricky uh, to pull off. They're super expensive <laughs> to figure out how to make work, um, but they do, provide some kind of models for figuring out how to have opportunities for people to be gathering in smaller, more concentrated groups um, that is attractive to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I also just, from what I've heard and uh, we've been following this, uh, most of the people at Ithaca let us know when they go to meetings, like what was successful and what wasn't. And, uh, but there's probably at this point more that wasn't as successful in the experimentation place. Uh, but one thing that particularly was, um, I think, challenging was the idea of trying to match people up beforehand into kind of, you don't know these people and here's your cohort that you can, you know, spend some time in little breakout rooms with. And I, I don't think the breakout rooms worked. I think people resented being, you know, match made, uh, match made in it. And, and yet those are the kinds of things that do happen at meetings when you happen to sit down at a table with five people and you don't know, you know, two of them and a conversation starts and it's just, I don't know how we build that kind of serendipity into um, the way relationships just are created uh, in these spaces. But that's gotta be part of the challenge if, if we're gonna do more of it online. Um, and, uh, and maybe it's just because it's smaller, you get that in a way that you don't get it and can't get it in a very big meeting. Thanks everyone. I just have a quick comments from a different aspect. Um, Laura, you mentioned about the difference about the in-person conference. You have like a separate conference time days, right? To focusing on whatever same like conference. 
Um, but right now, I guess the big challenge is uh, the online virtual conference integrated with your daily life and your daily job. So that, um, however, I I was thinking about something I might advocate in my local institution for spring is uh, what about if even it is a virtual conference, let's say this week, virtual CNI, I do the same thing like I did before for in-person conference, just to block my calendar. This is CNI virtual conference. I'm going to just focus on this topic, right? Again, this is, as a regular in-person conference, I still catch my work, like a, during the break or after a night or something. So again, I, I was thinking about that aspect if the society individuals organization try to kind of uh, building this kind of a new behavior, right? So as I, like for me, I still have a tons of a meeting during this week, it gets into my calendar. But what if we, we find a way still isolate ourselves for this topic? For me, I think the huge difference is if I do that, I will have my mental space to follow the conference even including the virtual one or pre-recorded one to build that kind of a scholarly thinking, strategic thinking. If I embed it with my daily work and daily life, it's very hard. Sometimes if you sit there, you're still doing multitask to do your work, right? So just want to offer that. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. And, and somebody, um, I think somebody said earlier in the chat, called it conference hygiene. Was that what it was? Um, go back here, but I think it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, conference hygiene, uh, Stephen, we talked about. Um, I, I, I don't think we actually have those habits right now, uh, most of us. Um, and so we're multitasking, or we're saying, oh, well, I don't have time to do this really. I'll li listen to this offline. And, um, you know, and then you're in a situation where you're sort of half in and half out, and you don't actually bring your, your full self to the conference, which, um, which is not what you're getting most of the time if you're there in person. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that, that this is one of the things that uh, a lot of societies and conferences have found advantages into stretching the conference schedule out, which is one way of thinking about allowing more people to access it, but also makes it easier to pop in and out of and to think of it as less of a kind of all-encompassing experience. At the other end of the uh, of the spectrum, there was a conference this spring, the, the Pita Palooza conference, that met for 24 hours straight and experimented with radically compressing the schedule to try to make more of an event out of it. And I wonder for the kind of the kind of issue you're raising about like how do you make it feel more like a conference? How do you dedicate the space to focusing on it and not on other things? If that model of like radically compressing the time so that it's something really feels like a concentrated event might be a, a potential model for recreating that kind of like all encompassing but relatively short duration event that people can justify taking all day Friday to go attend because it's going to be over as opposed to one that's going to go on for three weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I just think Zoom fatigue is getting more and more real for all of us. So the, I, the idea though of being, um, being able to concentrate for X number of hours a day after you've been on Zoom all day anyway, and then you're just going into you know full Zoom mode for the, you know for the conference, I I, I think that's going to get worse and worse for us if we're not careful. So 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 the idea of breaking up the time or thinking about, um, you know, a way to uh, to fit more in in in, in how we're going to learn when we're not online or when we are online as opposed to when we're surrounded by all kinds of stimuli at a meeting. And uh, you know, able to look at the other people, and able to you know everything you do when you're sitting in a you know in a session, and um, and it's and it's live. So so I, I do think a lot of this kind of presentation and timing is going to have to be um, rethought if if we're going to be successful. So we're approaching the end of our time. Um, there is an incredibly um, rich set of uh, comments. I, 
I've, I've never um, seen anything quite like this since we started doing virtual meetings. I mean, um, uh, I think people will want to be sure to save a copy of the chat from this because uh, it's really worth spending some time on. Um, before we let you go, let me ask a final question or a near final question. Um, uh, that calls for some speculation. Um, do you do you think that we're going to end up with a relatively uniform set of best practices and approaches um, uh, for conferences in the um, in the post pandemic era? Or do you think that there are going to be just like um, wild disciplinary variations in practice, um, uh, you know, where um, the engineers do one thing and the biologists do something very different and the historians do something yet again, radically different? I think that's a really interesting question. I think it's kind of an open question right now. Um, I mean, my sense is and, and that discipline and resources and staffing capability will likely play a significant role in how different kinds of organizations react to these kind of things. Um, some, some types of, some fields have much more in the way of resources than others, and that's going to necessarily shape their decision making. But I also think that some of it is going to come down to leadership and vision um, and willingness to uh, engage in really creative rethinking. Um, a, the conference is really a, a, a pretty venerable genre that hasn't has been very resistant to change over time. Um, and absent determined efforts to see things through, I wouldn't be surprised if inertia kind of pulls things back. Um, it may very well be the case too. I mean, I, I don't want to sound too, um, too much like a burn it all down guy, because I think some societies will make smart decisions that they want to go back to something that seemed like it was working pretty well for them. But there were, there are a lot of fields that, um, where there was already a lot of dissatisfaction about what was what the conferences looked like, whether it was declining attendance, whether it was concerns about carbon costs or or you know accessibility and equity issues, those issues are going to survive the pandemic and suggest the need for continued thinking about these things. Um, it's going to be tricky because these are hard steps to, ships to steer, and I think you, my hunch is that you'll see uh, a spectrum, but maybe not a super radical spectrum. Um, but I also expect there will be, there'll be some outliers um, that that will be instructive. Yeah, and my sense is that, uh, as with all things, technology is going to play a big part. Uh, uh, we don't yet have like the kind of standard platforms that tell us um, how to put on good hybrid meetings that are um, cost effective. Um, but you think about what Zoom has done to the way we do meetings now and the kinds of um, uh, innovations that they've introduced that have changed, or even something like PowerPoint. I mean, these, these kinds of things tend to homogenize the way we approach the these uh, new territories and in some ways channel the kinds of innovation that happen. But then within those technology choices, I think you get a lot of um, idiosyncratic and, and imaginative um, you know, uses and uh, uh, processes. So, so I think we, we can't count out technology as, as, as something that's going to be um, more and more an innovation factor uh, driving us. And I also think that adjacent industries that are completely dependent on events are going to be doing things that tell us new ways to think about how to present in the academy and how to build community online in the academy. Um, 
And we've got to be looking at them. That's one of the things that this project is doing is trying to find out where those innovations are happening um, in adjacent industries. Um, and so I think uh, even being exposed to that can help change the way we solve problems and, um, and experiment. Well, thank you. There's a lot. There's a lot in there to uh, to think about, um, and I I I can't resist just as we bring this conversation to a close, putting a big underline under something you said earlier about um, uh, repurposing and um, all of the the fact that we now have records of conferences in the virtual environment in a way we historically didn't um, in many cases and the implications of that and what happens to those materials. Uh, that's something that I've been watching very closely and I know you have too. And um, it's something I expect we're gonna come back to in. Um, in future CNI conversations, uh, because I think that that's another very significant thread here that um, we really, it deserves an hour in its own right, uh, at least. Um, but thank you so much. And I really hope that you will keep us posted on what you're learning uh, through this process, because it matters a great deal to all of us, I think. Thanks for the opportunity, Cliff. And it's been, uh, we're very excited about this project and uh, we feel like it's kind of green fields to, to understand yep. it's possible, so. Yep. All right, and uh, as I said, um, uh, people, people definitely should um, uh, snag themselves a copy of the, um, of the uh, chat from this because there's a lot of wonderful material in there. And with that, I think we are just about at time. Um, uh, we've kept Laura and Dylan a little long, um, uh, but I really didn't have a lot to say to close the meeting other than to thank the team at CNI um, who have made it run so smoothly, uh, to thank all of our presenters and not just the presenters, that you've seen during the synchronous meeting, but also all the presenters who made um, pre-recorded presentations. Uh, we, those will continue to be available. And um, there's a ton of really wonderful stuff in there. Um, so I hope that you will continue to, uh, to mine that collection of material um, and share it with your colleagues. I'll just mention that we will be sending out in the next couple of days uh, um, evaluation uh, questionnaire for, um, for this virtual event. We're going to do evaluation separately for the virtual and the, um, the in-person event um, since um, they, they, they have different sets of attendees. Um, I hope I will see some of you next week at the in-person meeting. Uh, for those that I'm not gonna see or speak with again, I wish you a good holidays and um, uh, a good new year. And um, I hope everybody will um, stay safe and uh, um, stay in touch. Thank thank you all for participating and particularly for participating so um, so eagerly in this last session um, uh, with all of your comments in the chat. Um, I know they're going to be helpful to Laura and Dylan and honestly they're very helpful to me as well. Um, so with that I will just say thank you and um, take care. <laughs>